Subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to take a heavy toll on families, communities and nations the world over. But it's also giving rise to incredible acts of generosity, solidarity and cooperation. We have said consistently that we're all in this together and we can only succeed together. We need an all of society approach with everyone playing their part. That includes people in the entertainment industry. Today, I'm very delighted to be joined by one of the biggest names in internet entertainment in the world, Lady Gaga, and my friend Hugh Evans, the founder and CEO of Global Citizen. WHO has been working with Global Citizen for several weeks on the Together at Home concert series with artists like Chris Martin and John Legend giving free online performances. Now we're working with Lady Gaga and Global Citizen to take this concept and make it even bigger through the one world together at home. Virtual Global Special on Saturday, the 18th of April. It's now my great pleasure to invite Lady Gaga and Hugh Evans to say more about this very special event, One World. Thanks, Dr. Tedros. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who's uh, listening and watching. I would like to thank the World Health Organization and uh, the United Nations, as well as Global Citizen. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros and Hugh Evans, for all of your leadership in this fight against COVID-19. Um, and thank you very much to the World Health Organization for asking me to collaborate with you on this special. We are all so very grateful to all of the healthcare professionals across the country and around the world who are on the front lines during COVID-19. This global pandemic is a catastrophe. I'm so thankful to them and I'm also praying for those who have sick, who are sick. Um, it's been a pleasure to partner with Global Citizen and we have been working all together behind the scenes to raise money for the World Health Organization. I would also like to send my prayers um, as well to people that are losing their jobs and are having a hard time feeding themselves and their children. Um, we are raising money for the World Health Organization's COVID-19 Solidarity Response Fund. And seven days, we held a, a, seven days ago, we held a call with more than 68 corporate leaders from some of the world's biggest and most generous companies. And I asked them to join my corporate kindness list as there have been many corporations and philanthropists that have been very, very generous during this time. Since then, we have also been calling on philanthropists around the world as well, and uh, tech companies uh, included. Um, again, I'd like to reiterate our, our deep gratitude to the medical community. I, um, I have my heart is, is, is very, very uh, uh, achy and warm for those who are ER doctors as well as nurses who are sleeping in cars uh, to make sure that they don't infect their families or their patients. Uh, the, what you are doing is putting yourselves in harm's way to help the world and we all salute you and you are a triumph truly. I am proud to say that um, over the past seven days we've raised a total of $35 million uh, for the Solidarity Fund. This money will include essential PPE supplies and testing kits around the world and will help improve lab capacity to rapidly process tests. It will also coordinate uh, research development. Uh, it is so important to think globally and to support the World Health Organization to curb the pandemic and prevent uh, future outbreaks. I know Dr. Tedros is uh, particularly concerned about Africa and uh, so are all. Uh, we also need to act locally by supporting local charities and initiatives so that the frontline healthcare workers and those in immediate need have the resources they need to survive during this time. It has been an honor to help with this huge broadcast event, which will take place on April 18th. 
uh, where we need to tell the stories of and celebrate the frontline community, healthcare workers and their acts of kindness. We will be on different networks, um, many networks actually. Uh, and I wanted to talk a little bit broadly about what we're going to be doing. What's very important is three things happen uh, for, uh, for all of us, that we celebrate and we highlight the, the singular kind global community that is arising right now. Two, we want to highlight the gravity of this historical unprecedented cultural movement. And three, we want to celebrate and encourage the power of the human spirit. Uh, I would like to, on behalf of the World Health, World Health Organization and Global Citizen, thank uh, Dr. Tedros as well as um, everyone that has uh, donated so far. We uh, are going to continue fundraising, but I would like to also let you know that this broadcast special is not actually a fundraiser. We will all, we all wanted to uh, raise the money before we went on air. So uh, when we do air live on April 18th, put your wallets away, put your cards away, anything away that you need to and sit back and enjoy the show that you all very much deserve. And I'd like to pass this now to Hugh Evans, who's been a wonderful partner of mine. Uh, Hugh, thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Dr. Tedros. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And thank you, Dr. Tedros. And thank you, Lady Gaga. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Lady Gaga, Dr. Tedros, you've both demonstrated extraordinary leadership at an unprecedented moment when our society is being challenged like never before. And we are so thankful for your leadership. I'd like to echo Lady Gaga's sentiment and commend the incredible acts of bravery demonstrated by the frontline community health workers around the world. And I hope that we, as a shared humanity, emerge from this moment forever grateful for the work of doctors, nurses, teachers, grocery store workers, and all of those who are the backbone of our communities. Global health is at the very core of the Global Citizen mission, and we must ensure that the world's poorest and most marginalized people have access to resources to cope with and tackle this health crisis. Through One World, together at home on April 18, we will be calling on philanthropists, corporations and governments to fund critical global COVID-19 response efforts, including distribution of resources and PPE to critical frontline healthcare workers. In our partnership with the WHO and United Nations, Global Citizen is committed to driving action to help ensure our global health systems are strong enough to stop a future pandemic before it happens. April 18 is going to be a moment of global unity, connecting the world through a historic global broadcast. We are bringing together the greatest artists in the world under the passionate and extremely talented curation of Lady Gaga. In alphabetical order, some of the artists we'll be announcing today include Alanis Morissette, Andrea Bocelli, Billie Eilish, Billy Joe Armstrong of Green Day, Burna Boy, Chris Martin, Sir David Beckham, Eddie Vedder, Sir Elton John, Phineas, Idris and Sabrina Elba, J Balvin, John Legend, Casey Musgraves, Keith Urban, Kerry Washington, Lang Lang, Lizzo, Maluma, Sir Paul McCartney, Priyanka Chopra Jonas, Shah Rukh Khan, Stevie Wonder, and many more to be announced over the coming weeks from all corners of the globe under the passionate and extremely talented curation of Lady Gaga. We are grateful to all of you for participating and supporting this critical effort. One World Together at Home will be broadcast live on Saturday, April 18th, 2020, 
at 5 p.m. PDT, 8 p.m. EDT, and 12 a.m. BST, airing on ABC, NBC, Viacom and CBS networks, iHeartMedia, and Bell Media networks and platforms in Canada. Internationally, BBC One will run the program on Sunday, April 19, and additional international broadcasters include Be In Media Group, Multi Choice Group, and RTE in Ireland. The digital broadcast will celebrate and support brave community health workers who are doing life saving work on the front line. And we've all seen the limitations of world leaders around this world to step up and face this extraordinary challenge. And we want to do our bit to support the essential work of the World Health Organization, driving action and raising critical funds. Thank you again, Dr. Tedros, and thank you, Lady Gaga, for your leadership. Thank you all. Um, thank you very much for our, to, to our guests, uh, for their remarks. Uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Tedros, I guess uh, you would like to thank them too. Once again, I would like to thank Lady Gaga and Hugh Evans for their partnership. We had a call last week, and I was so amazed by the energy and passion of Lady Gaga. It's incredible commitment to humanity. And that's when I said, I think what she has planned can happen. It's bring the world together to improve awareness and to mobilize resources to fight the pandemic. So I thank her for her incredible passion and commitment and leadership, and also to my friend Hugh Evans for connecting all the dots and for his leadership. We all look forward to joining you for the One World Together at Home concert on the 18th of April. As the pandemic continues to recognize that individuals and governments want to do everything they can to protect themselves and others, and so do we. We understand that some countries have recommended or are considering the use of both medical and non-medical masks in the general population to prevent the spread of COVID-19. First and foremost, medical masks must be prioritized for health workers on the front lines of the response. We know medical masks can help to protect health workers, but they're in short supply globally. We're concerned that the mass use of medical masks by the general population could exacerbate the shortage of these specialized masks for the people who need them most. In some places, these shortages are putting health workers in real danger. In healthcare facilities, WHO continues to recommend the use of medical masks, respirators, and other personal protective equipment for health workers. In the community, we recommend the use of medical masks by people who are sick and those who are caring for a sick person at home. WHO has been evaluating the use of medical and non-medical masks for COVID-19 more widely. Today, WHO is issuing a guidance and criteria to support countries in making that decision. For example, countries could consider using masks in communities where other measures such as cleaning hands and physical distancing are harder to achieve because of lack of water or cramped living conditions. If masks are worn, they must be used safely and properly. WHO has guidance on how to put on, take off, and dispose of masks. What's clear is that there is limited research in this area. 
We encourage countries that are considering the use of masks for the general population to study their effectiveness so we can all learn. Most importantly, masks should only ever be used as part of a comprehensive package of interventions. There is no black or white answer and no silver bullet. Masks alone cannot stop the pandemic. Countries must continue to find, test, isolate, and treat every case and trace every contact. Mask or no mask, there are proven things all of us can do to protect ourselves and others. Keep your distance. Clean your hands. Cough or sneeze into your elbow and avoid touching your face. Less than 100 days since WHO was notified about the new coronavirus, research has accelerated at incredible speed. The viral genome was mapped in early January and shared globally, which enabled tests to be developed and vaccine research to start. More than 70 countries have joined WHO solidarity trial to accelerate the, the search for an effective treatment. And about 20 institutions uh, and companies are racing to develop a vaccine. WHO is committed to ensuring that as medicines and vaccines are developed, they are shared equitably with all countries and people. I want to thank the Medicines Patent Pool and Unit Aid for the initiative they announced last Friday to include medicines and diagnostics for COVID-19 in their licensing pool. I also want to thank the President of Costa Rica, President Carlos Alvarado, and the Health Minister, Daniel Salas, for their proposal to create a pool of rights to tests, medicines, and vaccines with free access or licensing on reasonable and affordable terms for all countries. Muchas gracias, uh, Mr. President. I support this proposal, and we're working with Costa Rica to finalize the details. Poorer countries and fragile economies stand to face the biggest shock from this pandemic. And leaving anyone unprotected will only prolong the health crisis and harm economies more. I call on all countries, companies, and research institutions <clears throat> to support open data, open science, and open collaboration so that all people can enjoy the benefits of science and research. Finally, we are nearing the end of the Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. This is one good news. If there are no more cases, the government of the Democratic Republic of Congo could declare the outbreak over as early as this Sunday. We are not there yet, and we remain on full response mode. We are continuing to investigate alerts and to test samples. This would not have been possible without the incredible health workers who have put themselves at risk for more than 18 months to stop this outbreak. Just as health workers are putting themselves in danger to save lives from COVID-19, health workers in DRC face the double threat of fighting a deadly virus in one of the world's most dangerous and unstable regions, exposing themselves to Ebola and bullets. Tomorrow, as you know, is WHO's birthday, 
a day we celebrate each year as World Health Day. This year, we are paying tribute to the incredible contribution of all health workers, especially nurses and midwives. Nurses and midwives are the backbone of every health system. They are there from the first moments of life to the last. Tomorrow, we are publishing our first report on the state of the world's nursing, which highlights gaps and makes recommendations for all countries. One of the lessons I hope the world learns from COVID-19 is that we must invest in health workers, not only to protect lives, but also to protect livelihoods. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tadros. Um, uh, also, as uh, always, we have uh, Dr. Mike Ryan and Dr. Maria uh, Van Kerkhoff, who will uh, be uh, answering questions. So we will now open the floor. I will go to one question that I received uh, by email this morning and I promise to answer. That's uh, Ankit Kumar from India today. And uh, Ankit uh, is asking that uh, we have recently seen a spike in cases caused uh, to religious gatherings in India. In fact, almost a third of new cases were linked to one gathering in India. We have also seen incidents of violence against health workers due to fear and misinformation. Is WHO concerned with these developments? What is WHO's message to religious and community leaders as their followers? Um, the, uh, first and foremost, the, 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 the idea of violence against uh, health workers um, is driven by fear and it's driven by misunderstanding, but it's, 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 really, uh, it's really, really unacceptable. And we, we ask uh, everyone in every community to see our health workers as our heroes uh, and to support them in every way we can. Uh, with regard to uh, gatherings of any type, be they religious or be they for other purposes, there are always risks associated with such gatherings in the midst of a major epidemic. Uh, WHO has issued guidance on that. Many of these gatherings are now um, uh, postponed <clears throat> or cancelled. Uh, we've been working very, very closely with uh, religious and faith-based organisations uh, all over the world, um, including groups from the, the Islamic uh, tradition, um, uh, Christian traditions and others, uh, and continue to work through faith-based organisations to communicate using our EpiWin platform. We're also continuing to develop guidance specifically for the holy month of Ramadan uh, and are working through our Eastern Mediterranean Regional Office to be able to advise um, governments and religious uh, institutions on how best to manage the risks associated with such, a, with such holy events. But it, it's very important, again, <clears throat> uh, having uh, COVID-19 is not anybody's fault. Uh, every case is a victim. Uh, and every case needs to be treated with sensitivity as the health workers who treat them. So it's very important that we are not profiling COVID-19 along racial, along religious, along ethnic lines. This is not helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, so this was a question from Ankit Kumar from India today. Uh, now we will uh, go to journalists online. We'll start uh, uh, with uh, Jamie from Associated Press. Jamie, can you hear us? Hi, uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, please, go ahead. Great, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to just ask you about, um, over the weekend, Dr. Anthony Fauci mentioned that uh, as many as, if I understood it correctly, as much as 50% of uh, transmission could be uh, asymptomatic. And um, I just uh, sort of in line with that, um, if you could um, just give us a little bit more about um, what you're thinking about the, um, the, the fact that, um, that um, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hold on. That um, that that um, some some countries have, have have said that this um, that this uh, outbreak is is more um, infectious than uh, influenza. Um, three as much as CDC is saying that it's um, up to three times more infectious than um, influenza. So um, what do you have to say about that? Thanks. 
I'll start, and, and perhaps Mike or DG would like to supplement. Um, so the the modes of transmission and the way in which this virus is transmitted is of, of significant interest to all of us. Um, and what we are doing is we are working with member states, we're working with everyone that's affected by this, looking through the research and trying to understand when uh, most transmission is happening, when any transmission is happening. And what we, what we know from reports, what we know from published literature, um, is that the predominant way in which transmission is occurring is among sy symptomatic individuals. Uh, and these are people that can be symptomatic very, very early on in symptoms, even when they start to feel a little bit unwell. Um, and this is supported by some data that actually tries to attempt to capture virus from individuals who are symptomatic. We also know that people can, it's possible that people can transmit in the few days before they become symptomatic or in their pre-symptomatic phase. Um, there have been some studies that have come out and we learned about this when we were on mission in China back in January and early February, um, that there are individuals that can shed virus one to three days before uh, they develop symptoms. However, it's very important to note that even if you are pre-symptomatic, or even if you don't have any recognized symptoms, you still have to transmit through droplets. You still have to have these infectious particles that come out of your out of your nose and your mouth. Um, and so, we do. While we know that that is possible, we do not believe that that's a major driver of transmission. Now, we've also seen. Um, modeling estimates that suggest that there's large numbers of unrecognized transmission. And I used unrecognized on purpose because uh, I'm not saying asymptomatic. I'm saying that we may be missing people who are out there who are infected, but we're missing them because of current surveillance strategies. And that is certainly possible in many parts of the globe. Um, whether or not those individuals are asymptomatic, uh, we will have to wait until we see results of serologic studies, which we hope we'll be seeing in the coming days, if not weeks. Um, and so what we can say is that people, most people are transmitting this virus while they are symptomatic. Um, hi, Jamie. Just in addition to, because I think uh, we have, uh, I would never uh, in any way contradict uh, my good friend Tony Fauci, such an eminent man. Um, uh, there are many different uh, estimations of, uh, of what might represent uh, asymptomatic transmission or other infections in the community. And we do know, and everyone accepts that, when the seroepidemiology studies do come online, we will probably find more people who've been infected unknowingly. Um, there's no question of that. Uh, the, the thing we need to address in all of this is very often the idea of severity versus infection. And there is a huge um, association between the dose of exposure and the severity of infection. We see this in many other infectious diseases. So we also probably need to look at who is getting sick or very sick? And are there, <clears throat> is the dose and the type of exposure they're getting different to those who may be exposed and seroconvert in the community? So it's not just a matter of looking at uh, how many people in the community are infected, but are there specific elements of exposure that cause uh, individuals to have a higher dose of exposure or a sp specific route of exposure that causes a more severe infection? Uh, there's also that concept of infectious dose when we talk about the, uh, the different types of transmission. If somebody um, is exposed to a high dose from, um, from another individual directly uh, or from a, a surface that's high, heavily contaminated, you can imagine a large dose. Uh, in other circumstances, uh, individual particles or virus particles potentially floating through the air, the, it can be demonstrated that that may happen in certain circumstances, certainly in healthcare settings. But is that significant in terms of driving infection? Is that significant? Does that produce an infectious dose that can successfully infect another individual? And these are all very important things that still need to be studied. Again, we're only a number of weeks into this. I think we need to uh, have the CRAPI studies. I think we need more information on what is the infectious dose and particularly the relationship between the dose of exposure or infection and the severity of the disease subsequently, which has been seen with many, many other uh, diseases in the past, including cholera, Ebola, and others. Thank you very much, uh, Mike and, uh, and Maria. We'll go now to the uh, next question. That's uh, Kai Kuferschmidt. Kai, can you hear us? Hey. 
Yes, Tariq, thanks a lot for, for taking my question. So I just wanted to ask about, you know, the, the, the global push to try and find a pre-exposure prophylaxis or post-exposure prophylaxis. I understand there's several trials going on, um, most of them with chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. Um, I was just wondering whether you can speak a little bit to, you know, what role this could potentially play. And of course, also, there's a lot of smaller studies going on. Is there any way to make sure that they all um, you know, lead to results that can be pooled in the end. Uh, Maria can uh, give you more detail, but certainly one of the solidarity trials, I think uh, solidarity three or four, um, they, we have one of the trials under design, which will be a multi-center study, which will look at prophylaxis uh, in healthcare workers uh, to see whether there's evidence that giving uh, lower doses of drugs like uh, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine to health workers would reduce their risk of uh, becoming infected in a healthcare environment. Uh, those studies are certainly underway. And again, there are a number of those studies underway in, in smaller studies around the world. But again, as WHO, we're trying to bring together a larger set of collaborative studies that will give us the answers we need. In terms of post-exposure uh, prophylaxis, um, I don't believe there, we have at the moment a studies plan, but Maria can speak to that. But there, there is certainly evidence for the use of, um, or not, ev not proven evidence of effectiveness, but there are a number of studies underway and trials underway that use uh, hyperimmune globulin in the treatment of disease. In other words, they use the, the plasma, purified plasma of recovered individuals to give an antibody boost to people who are suffering the disease. Uh, similar uh, approaches have been used in post-exposure prophylaxis for other diseases, but Maria may be aware of studies underway in that area. Only to add that we have, um, as you mentioned, there are a number of smaller studies that are that are happening globally and across a large number of countries. Um, we have teams through our science division um, and through GORN, through the Global Outbreak Alert Network, um, who are pulling together available literature on a number of topics, one of which is actually looking at different types of therapeutics and drugs. And the idea is if it, until we can actually have a study that pulls together enough of a sample size to get these answers to these questions, um, we're trying to evaluate every piece of evidence that is published so that we could look at the, um, the way in which these studies were done. We can look at the strengths, we can look at the limitations, so that can help guide us closer towards an effective treatment for COVID-19. Thank you very much. Uh, next question is from uh, uh, BF BFM uh, uh, Radio. Is it uh, Kate who is from BFM Radio with us? Uh, yes, hi, good evening uh, or good morning. Uh, I'm actually from BFM Radio Malaysia. Um, my question is that uh, many countries around the world, they have imposed lockdowns or some sort of restrictions of movements. Of uh, So I was just wondering what WHO's guidance would be. What's the sweet spot, so to speak, uh, the kind of data that, that governments need to consider before uh, lifting or, or relaxing some of these lockdowns? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh... It is a difficulty for, for governments right now because the lockdowns in many situations are proving effective in, 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 in dampening the flames of the epidemic in, in, those, in, in those countries. But those lockdowns are also causing great economic hardship. And uh, everybody, especially in the developing world, uh, needs to get to a more sustainable way of managing this epidemic and controlling COVID-19 without uh, continuing to damage economic and social life. The transition strategy out of lockdown uh, requires a calibrated, stepwise approach. Uh, it will be probably very inadvisable just to lift a complete lockdown, all of the measures, because lockdowns are a general term that include closure of schools, closure of churches, stay-at-home orders, closure of workplaces. Uh, it's a mixture of different things, and I think each government needs to break out. What does our lockdown actually constitute? What are the elements of our lockdown? Uh, where is that happening in the country? Uh, do we now understand the epidemiology of the disease in each area in which we have an element of uh, lockdown or shutdown? Uh, and then to chart a path out, you have to build strong public health capacity to take over from the lockdown. In other words, the lockdown is pushing the disease down by putting people back in their homes, by separating communities. 
once you raise the lockdown, you have to have an alternative method to suppress the infection. The way to do that is active case finding, testing, uh, isolation of cases, uh, uh, tracking of contacts, quarantining of contacts, uh, and strong community education and participation and ownership around phys normal physical distancing, hygiene, and giving communities the power to control infection by, by in effect, managing their own physical distance, managing their own capacities to, 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 to support the response. In that situation, if you have strong public health capacity, if you've got a community that's mobilized and empowered, and if you've strengthened your health system, then you're potentially in a position to start unlocking or unwinding the lockdown. The specific parameters you need to be looking at are things on two sides. One uh, is it would be very inadvisable to lock down if the number of cases coming through the hospital are already at a level where your occupancy of, the of beds is nearly at 100%. You need to be in a position where you now have free beds in your system so that you're managing and coping with, with the caseload. Um, and, and that means you have some absorption capacity left. Uh, you need to look at, th at things like the doubling rate. How many days does it take for the number of cases to double? Uh, uh, you need to look at positivity rates. What proportion of all samples that we test are positive? You'll see in, in somewhere like Korea, they're testing 2 to 6% of their samples they test are positive. Uh, last week in New York, 37% of tested samples were positive. So you need to carefully look at what proportion of people I test are positive. You need to look at the number of contacts that are generated per case. And, and it goes on and on. And WHO will be issuing uh, guidance to countries that is much more specific around the, the, the parameters they should be looking at. There are no absolutes here. There are no answers. There are no numbers that say, if this number is this, then you do that. That doesn't exist. But what we can do is offer countries very specific measurements that they need to look at to chart the path out of lockdown. Uh, and that stepwise approach of unlocking somewhat and then waiting to see. I think you need to say we will, un we will, we will stop doing this element of the shutdown and then we will wait and we will look at the data. And if that works, we go to the next stage and the next stage. So a careful, calibrated, stepwise exit from lockdown with putting in place public health capacities, putting in place community capacity, building the capacity of the health system to cope should the disease bounce back up. That's the safe path out of lockdown. We want to achieve it as quickly as possible, uh, and we want to avoid many countries going into that circumstance, and we still have many countries around the world who are not in a lockdown situation. In fact, their epidemiology would suggest they can avoid the worst of this, and we need to support them to avoid them going into that situation. The most damaging lockdowns are in many developing countries where people, as the DG has said many times, can live from hand to mouth, not from paycheck to paycheck, but from day to day. And we have to find adapted solutions around lockdown and around disease control in vulnerable peri-urban populations living in poverty, in, 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 in poor rural communities. And we have to find other ways to manage alternative, adapted ways to manage lockdowns or slowdowns or shutdowns in those situations. Thank you very much. Uh, so this was uh, Kate from uh, BFM Radio uh, from uh, Malaysia. Now we will go to Nigeria with to uh, Metro Star uh, and it's Innocent. Innocent, can you hear us? Thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, not very well, but we will try. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you for taking my question. I have two questions to ask. One, how will WHO assess Africa country and what they've done concerning the lockdown and management of COVID-19? And then the second one, there's a news going around that vaccines are to be tested on Africa when it develops. How true is that? And is there a way, is there a window of, um, is there a window that in the near future vaccine will be developed for COVID-19? Thank you. Hello? Yes, we are, we are just trying to, to make sure that, uh, that we understood the question. So, uh, yeah, but we will try. 
This is, I think this is Nigeria, is it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, uh, Maria may answer the question around vaccine development. Uh, with regard to our general assessment on lockdown, and the, the Director General may wish to comment on this because he's been speaking with many leaders in Africa and I believe spoke with the, the whole of the African Union leadership and, and countries late last week. Uh, so therefore he's in a much better position than me to speak about that. We would uh, characterize, so far Africa is actually doing uh, well in this response thus far. Uh, countries have uh, essential capacities for testing. Many countries are taking strong action and want to really focus on finding cases and doing contact tracing as, as, and, 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 and trying to stop this disease becoming uh, much more extensive, uh, given the, the, the fact that health systems are not as strong uh, in, in many countries. Uh, they need support in that, though. They need support in testing, they need support in, uh, with protective gear, and they need, uh, they need to be given the resources to be able to mount those types of responses. So I would characterize that Africa has not suffered the worst of this pandemic so far. Uh, the worst of it can be avoided with very, very swift action to support those countries in Africa who really do want to take a comprehensive approach to this disease. Uh, and uh, with the many vulnerable people, including refugees and migrants who live uh, in those countries, it is, uh, uh, I suppose, our responsibility to provide that support. But DG, you may wish to speak about your interactions with the African Union countries. So I'll answer the question around uh, vaccines. So what we can say is that uh, there are a number of vaccines that are in development, uh, and vaccines will be tested through clinical trials with all ethical considerations um, in, in place in whichever populations are under study with informed consent, with open and transparent communication. Um, this is of the utmost importance. Not only do we have strong, robust scientific evidence, but we ensure that all of the studies that are done are done with appropriate and the highest level of ethical considerations. Um, one thing, if I could just mention on the first question around uh, Africa, is that um, there are a number of countries in Africa right now um, which have very few cases. Um, and Mike has alluded to this in his earlier response. Um, very few cases. Some, of, some of only have imported cases. And there is an opportunity here, this window of opportunity that the DG has spoken about exists in many countries still. Um, there is an opportunity to prevent the worst from happening in a number of countries across Africa and across countries that are still seeing their first case in some island countries. And we need to support uh, those governments, those countries, all of the people uh, in those areas to prevent the worst from happening, to prevent um, these individual cases from becoming clusters, these clusters from becoming community transmission. Um, and, and I think that's where we need to put a lot of emphasis on and a lot of support on so that we can prevent countries from reaching, an, reaching a point where they need to put in these very restrictive uh, movement restrictions. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question, uh, my brother from Nigeria. Uh, on the uh, situation, as uh, Mike said, uh, of course, when you see the number of cases, uh, the African continent has the lowest number of cases so far. Uh, but that doesn't mean that, you know, the situation uh, will not be, uh, will not deteriorate. It may. Uh, so Africa should do everything uh, to prevent uh, this situation from getting worse. And that's why um, African leaders are doing their best. I had a chance to participate in a meeting, a leaders' coalition, uh, which was uh, arranged or uh, invited by the uh, chairperson of the current chairperson of the African Union, uh, the, the president of South Africa, President Ramaphosa and many leaders from all corners of the continent have actually participated. And the um, main agenda is to have a continental strategy uh, and also, uh, you know, 
make sure that that continental strategy helps the national strategy. But in addition to coalition of political leaders or the uh, heads of states and government, uh, they have also agreed to have um, business leaders, coalition of business leaders. And business leaders in Africa are also getting together because uh, Africa will need uh, resources. And one of the major uh, problems that was uh, identified during the discussion was especially shortage of equipments, starting from medical uh, equipment, test kits, PPE and test kits, and, and, and so on. And the leaders have uh, agreed uh, to look for uh, concrete uh, solutions to address uh, the problem. And they also believe that considering the number of cases uh, we have in the continent, uh, testing cases, uh, tracing uh, contacts and isolating them, and meaning using the comprehensive approach will actually help. Uh, they believe that lockdowns alone may not help, or the physical distancing alone cannot help. And they have agreed to do everything to follow the comprehensive uh, approach. Um, and from WHO side, we have been supporting and we increased, improved the testing capacity in Africa significantly in the past uh, two months. And many countries in uh, Africa have now testing capability. Although, uh, you know, we may have shortage of uh, test kits, uh, but we're working on that too and we're finding different ways of addressing the gap, uh, but we will support the African Union, we will support the Africa CDC, and also we will continue working through our regional office in Congo, Brazzaville, our WHO regional office, and continue to support and uh, fight uh, the uh, pandemic together. Uh, then on the vaccines issue, uh, there was, um, I think, a comment last week from uh, some uh, couple of scientists uh, who said the testing ground for the new vaccines will be Africa. Uh, to be honest, I was so appalled. And it was um, a time when I said, when we needed solidarity, this kind of racist remarks actually would not help. It goes against the solidarity. Africa cannot and will not be a testing ground for any vaccine. We will follow all the rules to test any vaccine or therapeutics all over the world using exactly the same rule. Whether it's in Europe, Africa, or wherever, we will use the same protocol, and if there is a need to be tested elsewhere, to treat human beings the same way, equally. And the hangover from a colonial mentality has to stop. And WHO will not allow this to happen. And it was a disgrace, actually, and appalling to hear during the 21st century from scientists that kind of remark. And we condemn this with the strongest terms possible. But we assure you that this will not happen in Africa and will not happen elsewhere in any country. Proper protocols will be followed and human beings will be treated as human beings because we are all human beings. Then, after saying this, the vaccine development, we're addressing two issues, and we will be an announcing as soon as possible, hopefully during this week, a big initiative to accelerate the research and development and production of 
vaccines and also design mechanisms for equitable distribution of the vaccines. While we're looking for vaccines, unless we break the barriers to equitable distribution of the products, whether it's vaccines or therapeutics, we will have a problem. So we need to address the problem ahead of time. We need to address the problem of access or challenges to access ahead of time. And that's why we will put together a mechanism and we will appoint senior people from the North and South that will work out the details on how they can accelerate production, but at the same time, how they can ensure equitable distribution. And solidarity is very important here. When a vaccine or a medicine is ready, we have to be able to deliver it to all over the world. There should not be a divide between the haves and the have-nots. If we say solidarity, solidarity should be in its full form. And I hope each and every individual, each and every human being will go for that kind of solidarity. I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tedros. We'll take a couple of more questions. We go to uh, Yang from Xinhua News Agency. Yang, can you hear us? Can I hear you? Uh, can I hear you? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, as the uh, the World Health Day is approaching, uh, what do we have to say to the Chinese? Uh, what do we have to say to the frontline medical workers in China and around the world in the global antivirus efforts? And this question is for Dr. Tedros. Thank you. And if we understood well, the question is, what is the message to uh, health workers in China and around the world? The question is not clear. Can, if you can oh, maybe you can repeat the question, please. One more time, please. Uh, okay. Uh, as the World Health Day is approaching, uh, what do you have to say and what kind of message do you want to deliver to the frontline medical workers in China and around the world in the global antivirus uh, effort? I, I, I think I have uh, said it earlier. As you know, this is the year of the nurse and uh, the midwife, 2020. And um, we were ready to celebrate it in a big way. Um, and it was the main uh, event actually in our, uh, was supposed to be a main event in our assembly in mid-May. Uh, uh, unfortunately, um, there is uh, uh, this, we are in this uh, situation. Uh, but we will be launching a report tomorrow. This is the first of its kind. It's a report on the state of uh, nursing. Uh, we will uh, launch it tomorrow. That's the, during the World Health, Health Day. Uh, but while launching that report, although it's about uh, nursing, uh, we will celebrate all health workers, midwives, pharmacists, doctors, you, you name it. I think the world is now seeing um, how, uh, you know, the importance and the central role that health workers play. You know, people, when they're asked, of course, to choose, they would say health first. Because it's only when you're healthy that you can aspire anything. Whether it's wealth or fame or anything, it doesn't matter if you're not healthy. 
If you're not healthy, the first thing you ask for is to get back your health. And our health workers are making sure that happens. And they're central and very important for any individual. So not only during COVID, but during other times too, health professionals are very important because they are safeguarding that very important aspect of life, that's health. So we have to celebrate them every day. Of course, during COVID, we can see to what extent they're sacrificing. We have lost many of them. They're dying while saving lives. So my message first is to the public at large that each and every individual should recognize, whether it's during normal times or pandemics like now, to recognize the role of health professionals and to help them, to protect them, to really appreciate and respect what they're doing. And to the health workers, although you're doing, especially during this, during this COVID pandemics, although you're working in a difficult situation, you should know that your work is the most blessed one. Your work is something special to the extent of losing your life while helping others to live. And we respect you and appreciate you for that. And we also believe in you and that you will do everything to control this pandemic. But you should know that you have, and the world understands, the most important job. We can see the humility which is coming from some leaders because of this pandemic. I know they're seeing, starting from their own life and the whole world from a different prism. And they will also see your role. But the most important is not the recognition from the public or from leaders, but the internal commitment and passion you have and believing that you're doing the most blessed thing. And you have all our respect and appreciation. And we believe in you that together we will finish this pandemic. And all the respect and appreciation we have to you, the greatest respect and appreciation ever. Thank you.